Okay, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Adam Lashinsky today. Adam is the senior editor at large for Fortune magazine. Hopefully some of you got a free copy of his current issue. He's on the cover, this cover story on uh, Apple. He's based in San Francisco and covers, of course, uh, uh, Wall Street and the Silicon Valley. And as such, he's had a first-hand view of covering some of the titans of technology, including, of course, one of the uh, most important of all time, Apple, which is the focus of his new book, Inside Apple, How America's Most Admired and Secretive Company Really Works. Now, there's been a lot of praise for this book. Um, having gone online, I've, I've discovered that some of the most of the praise comes from people who follow Apple religiously, and there are a lot of them. It's amazing. They have their own sites and follow the stuff religiously. <laughs> but perhaps I think the highest tribute came from Walter Isaacson, author of the best-selling book, Steve Jobs, who wrote, Adam Lashinsky, one of America's best and most diligent technology reporters, has produced a fascinating glimpse inside Apple as it makes its transition into the post-Jobs era. So without further ado, please welcome Adam Lashinsky. Thank you, Skip. I think I was supposed to go that way, but that way seemed easier. Um, first of all, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I've turned my phone off because I don't want to be disturbed while I'm speaking to you. But uh, in stealing a line from a telecommunications industry executive I once saw speak who said that, you know, most people ask you to turn your phones off when they're speaking. He wanted people to leave their phones on because the sound of phones ringing uh, was, meant business to him and it was music to his ears. If I see people looking down at their telephones or their laptop computers while I'm speaking, I will assume that you're on Twitter, where my handle is at Adam Lashinsky, or on Facebook, where my subscription is also Adam Lashinsky, talking about what I'm saying and encouraging people to buy my book, and that's just fine with me if you'd like to do that. Um, I wish we had a copy of Fortune magazine for everybody. I'm sorry that we didn't. The opening anecdote in the book, uh, which tries to explain how the culture of Apple is or isn't changing refers to an investor meeting uh, that the company held recently that Tim Cook attended and Apple is known for being very frugal in some ways and then very free spending in other ways and the anecdote makes reference to one investor's observations that they came for this meeting and they were in this nondescript room with a, a couple of stale cookies and, and a few Diet Cokes uh, as the refreshments. And uh, I didn't sample, this my, sample them myself, but from, the, from appearances, the cookies are not stale here at the Milken Institute. And oh, good. They're, they're, and they're free. I, I'm not sure if that's what somebody shouted out. So I'm sorry this is such a demure and quiet crowd, but I'm going to try my best to liven things up for you by talking about uh, one of the world's uh, great companies, which has been the subject of of my research for more than the past year. My overarching thesis about Apple is that Apple does business differently from the way almost every other company does business, and in fact, differently from the way it's taught in business schools. And I've had the privilege of speaking at a handful of business schools. I hope to go to more. And I have said to the faculty who have come to hear me speak, if the world's most valuable, most admired, most successful, most innovative big company does things differently than the way you're teaching it in business school, wouldn't it be a good idea to at least consider teaching it differently in business school and perhaps to investigate the way Apple does things? Now, there's reasons why they don't necessarily teach it the way Apple does things because it's very difficult for them to find out how Apple does things because Apple won't tell them. And that's part of my, that's part of my thesis and part of what I'll get into with you um, this afternoon. It's important before delving into the modern Apple to talk for a moment about the bad old Apple, also known as the Apple that Steve Jobs referred to, uh, returned to in 1997. I found it's very difficult for us in 2012 even to relate emotionally to how bad off Apple was in 1997 when Steve Jobs returned to the company. Part of my own personal narrative that 97 is the year that I moved to Silicon Valley and I joined the San, ha San Jose Mercury News. And I was frustrated having joined the newspaper of Silicon Valley because I couldn't understand why my colleagues were so focused on Apple 
and why they were so negative about Microsoft. And I said, it's not really our place to be positive or negative. Microsoft is the dominant technology company in the personal computer industry. And Apple, while I realize they're just around the corner here, they're kind of not important anymore. They had single-digit market share. They were losing money. Jobs in later years would famously talk about the fact that Apple was 90 days from insolvency in 1997. They had too many factories, too many middle managers, too many warehouses, too many products. Uh, this was the year that Gil Emilio was fired as, as the CEO. It was the year of what we came to understand was a humiliating $150 million investment in Apple by Microsoft, which, by the way, from Apple's perspective, was good for the cash and also good because uh, Microsoft made a commitment to continue, manu to continue making uh, Office for the Mac. If it weren't for Office for the Mac, the Mac might have been even less relevant than it already was in 1997. And, of course, for Microsoft, the investment in keeping Apple afloat was uh, very important for antitrust concerns. The last thing that Microsoft wanted to discuss with the Justice Department in 1997 was how it had driven Apple out of business. And so it, it, it worked that year in 1997 to do just the opposite. Now, what, here's what Steve Jobs did with the company that he confronted that year when he came back first uh, unofficially, then as interim CEO or ICEO, the first instance that I can find of Apple out, out loud using, putting that little I in front of something, and then annoyingly putting that little I in front of everything for the next 15 years. But that was the first time. And um, first thing he did fairly quickly was to fire about 3,700 middle managers. These were people whom he felt didn't completely have the Apple culture. And the Apple culture, and you'll hear me say it over and over for the next 40 minutes or so, is about product. And that's all it's about in his, in his vision. It wasn't about making money. It wasn't about opening up new markets. It wasn't about, uh, you know, strategic incentives and other corporate jargon. It was about making products. So to get to making great products, in addition to firing these people, he killed a lot of products. Back in 97, Apple made printers. It made the Newton handheld uh, organizer. It even made a digital camera. I just found that out recently. He killed that. He also killed a bunch of computers. And he wanted to, he wanted to strip the company down to its bare essentials. And the bare essentials at that point, before the iMac, were two desktop and two laptop computers. He said, that's all we're going to do for the time being until we can do that really, really well. Um, he also wanted to blow up this concept of uh, a divisionalized uh, company of little feudal, uh, feudal lordships. So, for example, Apple had 16 advertising budgets when Steve Jobs returned to the company. And one of the things he did was said, from now on, there's going to be one advertising budget. And if you want your product to get advertising support, you'll come to me and you'll ask for it. And I'll decide whether or not you're going to get advertising dollars because I am now the only feudal lord of Apple. And there's going to be, and what this did by creating one advertising budget for, for an entire company was to further this idea of one company, one brand, one logo, one advertising message, one marketing message, and so on. It was not critically about cost cutting. Other things were about cost cutting at that point because they were losing money. But the consolidation of advertising spending and other kinds of spending was not about saving money. It was about consolidating power and focusing it on the company. Apple spent heavily on advertising in those early years after his return and obviously continued to spend uh, heavily. And in, in fact, in the next couple years, not only did advertising spend spike, but it spiked even higher as a percentage of, uh, of revenue because the country headed into a recession. Apple briefly began losing money again, and, and Steve Jobs kept spending money on advertising because it was important to promote this brand that he, had, that he was making so many investments in other areas to support. Now, to, to grasp how Apple's been run over the past 15 years, it's important to understand the leadership uh, style at Apple. And uh, while I was researching my, my original article in Fortune magazine, I came across a, an article in Harvard Business Review by a psychotherapist and business coach named Michael Maccabee. 
uh, Maccabee, uh, in, his, in, his, uh, in his therapist work, counsels executives among, and, and one of the traits that he identified among executives uh, as, are narcissists. He counsels these narcissists to channel their, their personality traits in a productive way so that they can use them for the greater good of their, of their company. So what is a narcissist in the corporate sense? And you, uh, you have the image just for fun of the, of the Greek god Narcissus uh, gazing fondly at his image in the, uh, in the pond because he enjoys looking at it so much. But in the corporate sense, the narcissist is a visionary is someone who is willing to take big bets on behalf of the company, someone who demands to be followed and doesn't particularly care about being loved, uh, doesn't care about hurting other people's feelings because that's less important than building the company. And as I was reading this, I, I thought to myself, he's describing Steve Jobs and he hasn't used the name Steve Jobs yet. And in fact, he did, um, he did write about Jobs being the prototypical productive narcissist. Uh, a couple of, uh, of other observations from Mac Maccabee. The productive narcissist typically has uh, a sidekick who helps him get things done. This person uh, he describes as a productive obsessive. An obsessive obsesses over the details, over the bottom line, makes sure that the trains run on time. N not necessarily, necessarily the things that the visionary narcissist will concern him or herself with. It's obvious to anyone who has followed Apple that Tim Cook, the current CEO, was Steve Jobs' productive, obsessive sidekick uh, for, his, for the entire rejuvenation of Apple. Uh, Maccabee talks about a third category, a uh, corporate category, by the way, called erotics. An erotic is someone in the corporate uh, atmosphere who does want to be loved, who is very sensitive to criticism. These can be very fine people to have on teams. Uh, not necessarily uh, the leader of a, of, a, of a corporation with so much tension and stress and strife as an apple. One of, the, um, one of the several characteristics that I'll suggest to you that where Apple breaks the rules, where it's different from other businesses, is in the way that Apple managers manage. Uh, a tenet of business for many years now, especially with some of the more prominent business gurus, has been that, uh, that good leaders should give their people uh, the leash with which to operate and with which to make their own decisions, should trust them to do their jobs because they're good at them. This isn't how Steve Jobs ran Apple. He micromanaged Apple. He micromanaged his people. His people micromanaged their people. He micromanaged their people, uh, and so on. And um, so my favorite example of this is the uh, executive whose job it was at Apple to send out an email that would go out to various constituencies, the news media, partners, uh, that co coincident with Apple product launches. So for example, a week ago today as I was sitting in the Moscone Center in San Francisco at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference hearing about new products, I received three emails while I was sitting there from Apple explaining what these new products are for people who weren't sitting watching the keynote as I was. The executive who wrote one of these told me that one of his tasks was to send the email in advance to Steve Jobs, to the CEO of the company. Here's the email that we're going to send out. They would then go back and forth 15, 16, 17 times over the wording in the email, ultimately disagreeing over the proper use of a comma or a semicolon in the email. I reviewed the specific instance this person was telling me about, and I've decided that Steve Jobs was wrong about the punctuation. <laughs> And it obviously doesn't make a bit of difference that he was wrong about the punctuation. The point is that the CEO of this company cared about the comma or the semicolon because that's the way he micromanaged and that was the importance of the attention to detail. One of the hallmarks of Apple's way of doing business is, is secrecy. Uh, all companies keep secrets, of course. The difference at Apple is that everything is a secret. And I, I encourage you to keep in mind this notion of Apple's culture that when it has an operating principle, it carries that principle out to the nth degree, to, a, to an astounding uh, level in terms of its consistency and its discipline. And so I've come to understand what other people I think might think are, is strange behavior. You know, why keep everything secret? Well, because we keep secrets. That's why we keep everything secret. 
Uh, this is a, a replica of a T-shirt that you can buy at the Apple campus at the One Infinite Loop company store, open to the public. I bought one when, in the middle of, of writing the book, I bought it for my editor and sent it to him. And he said, uh, you know, quit goofing around in the store and get back to work. And um, it, it reads, I visited the Apple campus, but that's all I'm allowed to say. Uh, it's it's uh, evidence, by the way, that Apple has a sense of humor about its corporate secrecy. It's the only evidence I've been able to find of Apple having a sense of humor about itself. But there you have it. Uh, Apple is a, uh, is a culture of fear. There's really no other way to put it. People are, uh, are afraid to divulge secrets, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, you find out about this when you attend new employee orientation, which takes place every Monday at Apple, unless it's a Monday holiday, in which case it takes place the following Monday. I belabor the point because I ask the question every Monday, and that was the response. Um, and you learn the normal stuff that new employees learn at, at all companies in new employee orientation um, until the security briefing starts. A security officer comes in and explains the importance of keeping secrets at Apple and explains them, by the way, in financial terms. This is the amount of money that we stand to lose, or, or put differently, this is the amount of money that we stand to gain by keeping our secrets well. What are the ramifications for not keeping secrets at Apple? Obviously, you'll be fired, and you'll, uh, you may be sued as well if we can prove what the damage is that you caused by divulging the company's secrets. And I remind you, this is your first day of work at Apple. <laughs> so why is it so important to keep secrets? Um, the obvious reasons are Business 101. This is not a departure from, uh, from the way everybody else does business. Obviously, you want to keep your competitors from knowing what you're doing. There's no reason to discuss that. Every company tries to do that. Apple does it better than most companies. In the, um, in the, in the device world, in the, the, the manufactured products world, it's also fairly important that your customers not know what products you're making until you're ready to sell them to them. So why is that? Well, think about it. If, if, if my company has products on retail store shelves, and even more importantly, in inventory in warehouses, the worst thing I can tell customers is that a new thing is coming in four weeks. Because who's going to buy the one in the stores at full, at full value, at full price, when they know that the, the shinier one is coming soon? And um, this is going to be, by the way, more and more difficult for Apple to keep up, but they've done an extremely good job of keeping these types of secrets, of gracefully managing down the inventory in the stores and then giving us the new one and getting us to pay top dollar for it. They've done this much better than other Silicon Valley companies in particular who've uh, torpedoed entire financial quarters by allowing word to get out, sometimes even telling people straight out that something new w was coming and diminishing people's interests in what exists. The, my, my far bigger realization in researching Apple has not been their external secrecy. However, it's been their internal secrecy. Apple people keep secrets from each other. And this flies in the face of the transparency that has become the mantra of, of businesses, I think, everywhere else. Business leaders should be open. They should share their plans with their employees so that everybody can have a, 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 a cohesive sense of what's happening at the company. And that's not at all the way Apple does it. Uh, I liken Apple employees to a horse fitted with blinders. As an Apple employee, you don't look left, you don't look right. You charge forward with all of your energy focused on your job, not, some, not somebody else's job. Um, teams will be, will be set up to compete with each other without the knowledge uh, that the other team is working on the same thing or something similar. And Apple people are actively discouraged from talking with their own uh, colleagues about what they're working on. So if you and I are both at Apple, but we're on different teams, your business is none of my business, my business is none of your business. Why do this, and what are the consequences of it? And I know people are thinking in the back of their minds, what does this mean to morale? I'll save that for later, because it's, 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 one, of these, it's one of these cosmic things, and it's not as nuts and bolts as the things that I'm talking about. Obviously, just like in wartime, just like with a security agency or an intelligence agency, the fewer people who know secrets, then the lower the likelihood is that the uh, secrets are going to be divulged. Loose lips sink ships, and there are not a lot of ships sunk at Apple. I don't encourage anyone to try to say that. I've never done that before. 
Um, but here was one of the unexpected consequences of this culture of internal secrecy at Apple. Over and over, I was told that Apple is not a particularly political organization, that below a certain very high level, there's not a lot of politics played. And I treated that statement with journalistic skepticism. I've been doing this for a while. All companies have politics. I don't really believe that. And then people would keep telling me, not a very political place. And then it dawned on me. If you don't have the information with which to play politics, it's highly unlikely that you'll play politics. You're not going to stand around at the water cooler and talk about something you've been told you're not supposed to talk about and, and run the risk of your boss hearing you talking about it. So what are you going to do? You're going to work. <laughs> and you're going to work on your assignment. And that's the way Apple people are. And I think you'll hear me make a handful of comments where this, the, the summation of it is that these people work hard and they produce a lot. And remember, our goal is to try to understand how it is that they're the most valuable company in the world. I describe Apple as the ultimate need-to-know culture. It's a, it's a company where the language around need-to-know is disclosure. Again, just like a top-secret government agency. The question is, are you disclosed on this topic? If you're not disclosed on this topic, then you don't belong in this meeting and we can't continue. Now, an awkward kabuki ensues. If I, don't, if I don't know if you're disclosed, how can I ask you about the topic? But Apple people really go through this, and they make sure that the people in the room are, in fact, disclosed. There's a physical nature to this. Apple will all of a sudden create new work areas that are devoted to a new top-secret project. Now, if you're not on this project, all you know when you see the carpenters arrive and put up new walls or maybe change out what were transparent uh, windows with frosted glass windows, all you know is that a secret project is going on and you're not working on that secret project and you're not supposed to ask. Um, this is one of the ways that Apple creates the environment of a startup, which I'll talk about a little, a little later, but um, this in fact is what happened when they started working on the iPhone. They created a new area for it and put those people who were working in it away from everybody else so that they could work in splendid isolation. Apple refers to these physical areas as lockdown rooms. No information goes in and no information goes out without the express authority of, of the people who are running the lockdown rooms. Security badges don't get you everywhere on the Apple campus. They only get you into the places that you're allowed to go. And I, I had more than one person tell me that their bosses weren't necessarily allowed to badge into the same places that they were allowed to go because their bosses didn't need to be there, apparently. <clears throat> this beautiful picture that only an organizational behaviorist could appreciate is, uh, uh, is, is Fortune Magazine's creation of, Apple or, of Apple's organizational chart. Uh, we first created it a little over a year ago in the Fortune 500 issue when I wrote an article with the same name as my book, Inside Apple. And uh, it was, candidly, more dramatic when the Sun King, Steve Jobs, was in the center of it instead of this other fellow, Timothy Cook. But you're not expected, by the way, to be able to see the small print on this, but it is highly accurate as of a few months ago who these people are. The, inner, the people in the inner circle in the orange are the executive team. The, I don't know exactly how many there are. I think it's nine right now, but it's ten is the, is the actual number. The ten people who really run this giant company with the CEO, the people around them are the vice presidents, and the, Apple doesn't have a lot of vice presidents for a company of its size. What I'm, hop what I'm hoping to show you with the, with the chart pictorially is how close the CEO is to these second-rung people who are the, the, the meat of the company. These VPs are very, very powerful. Think, you know, cardinals in the Catholic Church or, 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 or a general staff in, in the U.S. Army, so something like that. Um, the CEO does not have to look out very far to speak to these uh, vice presidents. As an aside, as you might imagine, uh, <clears throat> org charts are a controversial topic around Apple because Steve Jobs hated them. They don't print org charts the way other companies do, and headhunters and other people in Silicon Valley badly wanted to see an Apple org chart. And so when we published the org chart in the magazine, it created quite a stir. And uh, I was told that uh, some people were nervous about having the magazine open to this page on their desk at Apple because they didn't want their bosses seeing that they were looking at this, at, at this org chart. This goes back to some justifiable or not uh, 
uh, paranoia that, that Jobs had about not wanting his people to be poached. In fact, there was a time when it was extremely difficult to find out who the vice presidents were. It's a little silly today because anybody in a relevant field knows exactly who these very powerful executives are. But still, uh, the general public does not know who they are. These are people who would be famous at uh, almost any other company and are more or less unknown at Apple. <clears throat> Okay, I mentioned earlier that, that, Apple, uh, that Apple sweats the details. The details are very important to this company. Uh, historically, from the good old days, we've, we've heard the story that Jobs was obsessed with the, uh, the, compon with the makeup of the screws on the inside of the first Macintosh. In other words, the screws that customers would never see. Uh, David Kelly, the founder of IDEO and who was a consultant, a design consultant to Apple for many years, tells the story of, of receiving phone calls from Steve Jobs at 3 in the morning wanting to discuss these screws. And I think when their relationship was new, he would say, are you crazy? Why are you calling me at 3 in the morning? And uh, over time, he came to realize that he was crazy and that he didn't have to ask that question. <laughs> but, but... I'll tell you a more modern version of, of the detail orientation of Apple that I will that I'll go ahead and ruin the punchline and suggest to you that it's not crazy behavior. So, and this, and what I'm about to tell you is something that Apple uses as a case study to teach its own people about the importance of details. In the early days of the uh, iPod, it was the job of a packaging designer to hole up in one of these lockdown rooms that I told you about with hundreds of prototype boxes of iPod boxes. And the, the specific task in question was to work with that little piece of clear adhesive tape that, that closes the box that the customer peels back when they open the box for the first time and to make sure that that little piece of tape was in just the right place and to do other things like to make sure that the boxes fit together nicely on store shelves and so on. But the task here was to open and close and open and close and open and close and this went on for a matter of weeks with doing nothing but making sure that the customer experience was going to be good on the box. Now, sounds like kind of strange behavior unless there's anyone in the room who in recent memory has bought an iPod or an iPad or an iPhone and can remember what it felt like to peel back that little piece of adhesive tape, open the box, see their gorgeous device stacked very neatly on top of very beautiful literature that was going to explain their product to them, taking the little thing off, out, out of the box and holding the gorgeous object in their hand and feeling like a better person for it. And now you begin to understand why it was worth the time of that packaging designer to open and close and open and close and open and close the little piece of adhesive tape until they got it just right. And think about magnifying that across the whole company, uh, including in far more important areas than cardboard packaging, um, to make sure that they get the customer experience just right. One of the um, ways that Apple's very different from other companies, and uh, I, I, I talk about this all the time, and I find the people in traditional industries not only don't believe what I'm going to say, but don't accept it either, or don't accept it and don't believe it, that Apple doesn't do customer research. Now, Jobs would famously say, we don't do customer research. Why would we want to ask customers what they want when they don't know what's possible? That's our job, is to tell them what's possible. And, um, and it's true. Apple doesn't do traditional customer research. Where people get confused about that is that what they mean by that is front-end customer research. When they're creating something new, they don't, you know, stick their finger in the wind or they don't do focus groups and say, what would you like? They absolutely pay attention to how customers use their products, and I'll come to that in a little bit. But Jobs would say, we're the customers, we are customers, we executives are customers of Apple. That's how we know what customers want, because we're building products that we ourselves would want to use. The example he liked to use was that we, the executives of Apple, hated our smartphones, and we wanted to make a better one, and so we did. Uh, you wouldn't ask a customer uh, or, or a prospective customer, how, especially a BlackBerry customer, how would you feel about a phone that didn't have a keyboard? Because they would all say, absolutely not, no thank you. 
but we know what happened with, with the iPhone, including with many BlackBerry customers like myself who managed to make that transition from having a keyboard to not having a keyboard. I just really enjoy this photo of the Apple faithful standing in line in the rain outside the uh, 24 by 7 Apple store on 5th Avenue, uh, undoubtedly on a launch day to receive whatever goodness Apple was delivering to them that day because Apple was telling them what they wanted, not the other way around. Um, <clears throat> in integration is, is a key word at, at Apple. And people who are, who are in the technology industry now understand that Apple's ability to integrate the hardware and the software has been one of its keys to success over the last 15 years. The Macintosh famously was hardware and software made by the same company. It was beautiful. It was better than the PC. Everybody knew that. But they still got their butts kicked for a variety of reasons. But they kept at it. And where that soared was when they did the same thing, integrating the hardware and the software on the iPod, the iPod with the iTunes Music Store and the iTunes software, and then obviously on the iPhone and the iPad. By the time the iPad came around, it was a given of what the power was of integrating the hardware and software. As a side note, we d I don't know what, what happened today, but the press report said that Microsoft was going to release uh, its own tablet today, a tablet computer to compete with the iPad that was going to be an integration of its own hardware and its own software, something that Microsoft has only done so far on the Xbox, which has been something of a success, and the Zune Music Player, which was not, but which Microsoft certainly didn't do with PCs. They let their hardware partners make, make the PCs with their software. Now, less well understood is the fact that Apple integrates everything it does, not just it's uh, not just its devices. And so one of the many paradoxes of Apple is that on the outside, Apple has this image of being this happy-go-lucky, carefree place where everybody's beautiful because that's the advertising and marketing message of Apple. Behind the scenes, it is a very process-oriented, very milestone-oriented, very integrated, well-organized company where product management, marketing, manufacturing, and engineering all work well with design. And design is in caps, and it's the biggest because culturally it's the most important thing at Apple. The Apple products start with their design, and then the other corporate functions follow. A lot of uh, design consultants tell me the co most common thing they hear prospective clients say to them is, I want to do design the way Apple does. And the response is, no, you just think you want to do design the way Apple does. When you're prepared to do the following, we can do design the way Apple does. And here's one of the, the, mind, the mindset of Apple design is that it would be preposterous for a designer, for an industrial designer at Apple to be told by a financial person, we can't afford to do what you're suggesting. We can't use that material. We can't make it look that way. It doesn't cost out, for example. Or we can't buy the tools to do that. Or there isn't enough material in the world to make that work. The financial person who said that would not have a long financial career at Apple because the, uh, the designer would say, I don't think you heard me correctly. <laughs> this is how it's going to look. Your job is to go get the materials and cost it out and do what you need to do so that we can manufacture it that way. Now, it helped that the head of design, Johnny Ive, had lunch most days with the CEO, Steve Jobs, when he was healthy. Everybody knew that when the designer said, don't talk to me that way, that they had the CEO's backing. But I, I would submit to you that it's part of the company culture and, and, is, and partly explains Apple's success. A key cultural attribute of Apple is the, um, not just the willingness, but the requirement to say no and that saying no is more important than saying yes. Jobs would say it's more important to say no even to good ideas than it is to say yes. So what did he mean by this? He, he would say that you know, we only have so much time, we only have so many resources. Even though the company has, has so much money, it can't spend all that money because it takes people to spend the money. And so instead, we're going to avoid certain things. We're going to avoid features on our devices. We're going to avoid whole areas of business, like focusing on big businesses, for example, the enterprise. And instead, we're going to focus on the consumer. 
And by focusing on a few products, on a few features, on a few markets, on a few sales approaches, we'll come out ahead because we'll have focused that energy rather than being this mishmash, this risk-averse approach that most of the rest of the business world, by definition, is. Most businesses say, no, we've got to do more because we're going to screw some of that up and we've got to make sure some things fail. And Apple has taken the complete opposite approach, which is to say, we're going to put all our energy into this and, and we're going to live or die with that. Um, to illustrate the point, I've, I've mocked up what the out-of-box experience looks like when you buy a PC versus on the left versus the out-of-box experience uh, when you buy an iMac. Uh, I showed this at Microsoft a few months ago and I apologized in advance. I said, you're probably not going to like this, but it, it is what it is. Uh, I need to create a new slide. I'm going to turn the iMac screen and I'm going to put a PC screen to show you what you see when you uh, turn on your, your PC that you buy at, at retail. Because what you'll see on the PC screen is what Steve Jobs referred to as crapware. The crapware are these little icons that are, the, that are the come-ons that the manufacturer has put there to improve margins or to make up for some deficiencies of the machine the way, the way that they were shipped. Um, I am not and will not suggest that Apple is perfect. I could give a whole discourse on where Apple is not perfect. But it doesn't attempt to insult its customer within the first 20 minutes of them turning on the device. <laughs> And uh, what, what you can see from a side angle here is the very clean and very beautiful uh, welcome screen that you see when you turn on your iMac for the first time. Um, getting back to saying no, however, the, the saying no is, is, is part of the, the mentality of, of the company. And so, and this is another area where I think both in very substantive and also sort of superficial but important ways, Apple is so different from other companies. So Apple by and large, doesn't do other people's events. You don't see Apple people at conferences speaking on panels about the state of the industry. They'll say, why would we take our time to go talk about the state of the industry? We're trying to beat the hell out of those people, and we're too busy back in Cupertino making these terrific products. They don't even participate anymore in Macworld, which was a conference created for them and for their products because they say, first of all, they do their own terrific events, like the one I went to last week. And importantly, they have a direct relationship with their customer now through their uh, several hundred strong Apple retail stores ar around the world. Their customers walk in and they present to them every single day. They don't need an event like Macworld anymore to communicate. And then just because I, I think it's good mischievous fun, I mocked up what it might look like to have to see an Apple executive on stage at the World Economic Forum in Davos because you will not see an Apple executive talking about the state of the world in Davos. And if you do, I highly recommend that you sell your Apple stock or short, uh, or short any stock that's available because this will presage a, a, a bad change in the culture of Apple if they were to take the time and money to go off to Switzerland in January. Uh, another way that Apple is different from so many other businesses is uh, their, their cultural embracing of responsibility and accountability. Remember, this is a big company. And big companies are terrible at responsibility and accountability. They say, well, this person's in charge, or there's two-in-a-box executive management, or cross-divisional pollinization, or something like that. Instead, at Apple, they have something called the DRI. The DRI stands for the Directly Responsible Individual. I describe this as one of the brain-dead obvious business tactics that Apple follows, that any company, any organization, nonprofit, church organization, government entity, could and should follow. You go to a meeting at Apple, there's a list of uh, action items on the agenda. Next to the action item is a name. That, is, that person is the directly responsible individual. They're the one whose job is to get that action item done, not someone else not a partner in a different part of the company, their job to get it done. And if that means working with other parts of the company, then they're the person who does it. Interestingly, the DRI predates 1997. This has been part of the Apple culture since before Steve Jobs um, uh, came back. Uh, it's a very effective way of communicating, but not easy necessarily to replicate it. After the, my article came out, my original article in Fortune, I also run Fortune's 
I co-run Fortune's technology conference each year, and I started asking in our internal meetings, well, who's the DRI on that? And I could tell over the telephone that they were rolling their eyes and saying, you know, Lashinsky's being obnoxious again about the, the Apple DRI stuff. And it's not easy to replicate just because it's so obvious. Apple is different from other big companies in that it, they have worked very hard to not be divisionalized. They, are, they do not have general managers who own a business. That's how you'll hear other companies refer to it. I own the iPod business. You don't hear that at Apple. And so the company has one P&L, one profit and loss statement, and that P&L is held by the chief financial officer who reports to the CEO. What this communicates to the organization is that your job as a leader in an organization is to do your job, is to do your function. If your function is to design product, then you design. If your function is to build, manufacture, you build and manufacture. To market, then it's to market and so on. Your job, and this is very hard for especially MBAs to understand, is not to make money. That's the company's job. That's the CEO's job is to make money. Your job is to get it done. So for example, the graphic arts is done across the company. The person who runs Apple's online store does not choose the pictures that go on the online store. That any other general manager of an online store would choose their own photographic images, but not at Apple. That person's job is to, is to make sure that, the, that the, function, the sales function of the online store works, not to be concerned with something uh, like aesthetics, which somebody else is going to be better at, arguably. I mentioned earlier that Apple is able to behave like a startup, um, even though it is not a startup in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I liken the people who are, who are put off in these other areas to being uh, kind of like rich kids. They're, they're young and immature in the sense that they don't have the baggage of the corporation and they're working on something new, but they have very rich parents. Their parent has $100, $110 billion in the bank, and so resources for making this new thing are not going to be a problem. The top 100 is a, is a super top secret offsite that Steve Jobs would have approximately every year when he was healthy, where he would take the top 100 or so executives in the company, by his definition, not according to rank, uh, to some secret location like a hotel in Santa Cruz or Monterey Bay for a several day long presentation on what was coming down the pike in terms of products at the company. This is very important at a company where secrecy is paramount. The bottom 90 or so would have no idea what the new products were, and they would learn at, at this offsite. Jobs knew that it was a huge honor to be chosen to attend the top 100. He expected you to be honored if you were chosen, and he, and he, he expected you to be hurt if you weren't chosen, especially if you weren't chosen last year. That meant something that he was excluding you uh, from this meeting. He wanted you to be bussed down in buses from the corporate headquarters in Cupertino. And I, I just sort of am amused by some of these executives who are worth $100 million being forced to get on a bus because he didn't want them driving on their own. He didn't want them putting the meeting on their calendars because it wasn't supposed to be known throughout the company, even though the subordinates of these executives knew because they had to help them prepare presentations for what was going on at the top 100. But it was an important um, team building exercise for the very most senior people. He was so paranoid about um, leaks, by the way, that he had the rooms uh, um, swept for bugs. And at least at the last Top 100 that he presided over as CEO, he, um, he wouldn't allow anyone to talk while there were food servers in the room for fear that the food servers could be spies from Samsung or, some, or something like that. Uh, and I reported in this uh, story in, in uh, Fortune magazine just recently that Tim Cook held his first CEO as, uh, his first Top 100 as CEO uh, a handful of weeks ago uh, in, in, in Carmel, in, the Car in Carmel Valley in, in California, and that, and that the executives were, were extremely energized by what they saw. I wish I could tell you what they saw. I, I didn't. I, I don't know. Apple's really good at marketing. I'm not telling you anything you don't know uh, 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 in saying that, but what they're really good at is crafting their, their lines carefully and then making sure that they deliver their lines consistently. 
And so I describe an executive who explained to me that when the iPhone, not the iPod, which you're seeing here, that I just like a thousand songs in your pocket because it's something that any third grader can understand. And that's important when you're trying to market. The competition was talking about gigabytes or megabytes or something like that, and they talked about a thousand songs in your pocket. When they debuted the iPhone in 2007, five executives were authorized to speak publicly. Just five. This didn't include some of the most senior executives who had worked on the product. And the reason was so that they could control the message and make sure that the people who did speak said the right things. And one of the people who was one of the five explained to me that when you're communicating something like this, your intellectual tendency, your human tendency, is to change things up because you get bored. But you have to remind yourself that your, your listener is hearing it for the very first time. And we worked very hard to script this line. You want to deliver the line exactly as we scripted it so that they'll repeat it to their friends, who will repeat it to their friends, who will repeat it back into the marketplace. Again, the way we wrote it, because it's good. And that's how we want it getting, re getting repeated. I mentioned earlier that Apple can be frugal, but they can also be free spending, and they always have been. And the, um, my illustration of that they will spend whatever it takes comes from an episode in 2005 when uh, Apple introduced iMovie, uh, iMovie HD, which stands for high def. Now, again, hard for us to remember, but in 2005, high def was new in the marketplace. There weren't a lot of cameras, and there weren't a lot of televisions that did high definition. And Apple has been very good at, at proselytizing new technology that they've embraced. And they were coming out with iMovie, which was, for the first time, going to be able to support high def. So they wanted a good movie to show at Macworld in a demo why high def was so cool and what you could do with the iMovie software. Um, they also knew, and this gets back to my point, that they do pay attention to how customers use their product, that people used iMovie to shoot weddings. This was one of the popular uses for of amateur, for amateur uh, movies, was to shoot weddings. So they decided they were going to shoot a wedding. And they found an Apple employee who was getting married at the uh, Officers Club in the Presidio in San Francisco, and they shot her wedding. And it was a beautiful, elegant, indoor affair, um, and uh, you know, with gorgeous flowers, and, and just, just really wonderful. And they showed the footage to Jobs, and as was his want, he hated it. <laughs> Only I have on good authority that those weren't the words that he used in, in, in expressing uh, his, his dislike for, for the movie. And he said, you know, this is too serious, it's too somber, I want this to be uplifting and beautiful, someplace tropical, maybe Hawaii. I want to see a sunset and feet, bare feet in the sand and maybe a cheek coming down the father of the bride's cheek. And um, by the way, this was three weeks before Macworld that they were having this conversation. So at great expense, uh, the product marketing team first uh, called down to Hollywood and said, do you have any actresses or models who are getting married soon in Hawaii, preferably right before New Year's, because remember, for them to appear in Apple advertising or marketing, they need to be beautiful, because you're going to be beautiful too when you buy those products. And they found somebody, and so someone who was getting married in Maui right before New Year's, at tremendous expense, they sent a camera crew out. They staked out the sunset because they wanted to know where the sun was going to set. They offered to buy the bride flowers and also to provide a videotape of, of the wedding to her. They shot the wedding. They, they uploaded the, uh, the footage back to California. They showed it to Steve Jobs. He loved it. They showed it in a 30-second clip at Macworld and also in a couple of other places. And it was you know, a big success. This was one of many things that they showed at Macworld that day. A lot of money was spent for this 30-second clip. And the, the dollar amount was completely meaningless to them. It was money well spent. It was exactly what they wanted. Never mind that they had to throw away the other stuff that they had done at great expense. And this happens over and over and over at Apple in their pursuit of capturing things exactly correctly. And it's not just in marketing. It's in manufacturing and design and every other part of the company. Uh, I've mentioned simplicity is important. Uh, this is not, this is at every part of the company, obviously in the design, um, but also in how they market. And uh, this is what, this is actually painted on a wall in a product marketing building at Apple. So that if you work in that building, you walk around that wall. 
uh, when you come to work each day to get to your desk. After you badge in, you go around this, only this isn't exactly what it looks like. This is. I just love that because it doesn't require any, any further explanation. Um, another way Apple's different from other companies is that most companies, and I know this as a Fortune magazine writer, are, uh, are, are you know, kind to the point of being obsequious with the press. They want press coverage. They want to talk about themselves. They want to talk about their executives, who, of course, are trying to advance their careers. And Apple takes the exact opposite approach. They don't want to talk to a pesky writer from Fortune magazine who wants to talk about how you do what you do, because how they do what they do doesn't help them sell products. What does help them sell products are product reviewers for major publications. And uh, I will just tease you and encourage you to read my book to see the anecdotes I have about the very special treatment that Apple reserves for David Pogue of the New York Times and Walt Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal, who are incredibly influential to helping Apple sell its products in North America and beyond. Apple also understands the importance and the power of celebrity to its image. Why do I have a picture of Harry Connick Jr. on the screen? Because uh, Apple has a process of escalation for when something needs to get escalated to the top. In Harry Connick Jr.'s case, a handful of years ago, he started at the top by emailing Steve Jobs saying he had a problem with his monitor. Steve Jobs emailed uh, Tim Cook. Tim Cook emailed a senior executive in the supply chain organization who emailed a junior executive in the supply chain organization who got Harry Connick Jr. a new monitor within 30 minutes or so because Apple understands that it wants famous people, beautiful people, important people to feel good about its products. Now, I've spent uh, all this time talking about uh, my admiration for this company that I've been studying, even its difficult aspects. Uh, and so I'll end by making an observation about what Apple's challenges could be going forward. Apple, unlike any company its size, behaves entrepreneurially. And I think we all know the reason why. They were run for the last 15 years by one of the greatest entrepreneurs we'll ever know. Now, I didn't say one of the greatest scientists, one of the greatest inventors, uh, but one of the great entrepreneurs in Steve Jobs. His family put entrepreneur on his death certificate. The current leadership does not have any entrepreneurial experience. Tim Cook in the upper left bled IBM Blue for the first 10 plus years of his career. Um, Scott Forstall in the upper right, uh, has work, who, is, who runs uh, mobile software and is considered one of the brightest uh, charismatic engineering types at the company, has worked for precisely two companies in his career, both founded by Steve Jobs, Next and Apple. Uh, Johnny Ive, the world famous Sir Jonathan Ive, the head of industrial design for Apple, has, um, has uh, also only worked for, for uh, a small handful of companies. He once ran his own design firm in... Um, London called Tangerine. And somebody needs to do a piece on the uh, odd coincidence that the two companies he's worked for have been named for fruits. Um, he gave an interview once where he said that he didn't really care for the business aspect of, of running that design consultancy. And I say bully for him. He then went on to become the, the industrial designer for Apple and has been able to focus on design for all of these years, but not business. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to take Bob Mansfield, the head of hardware engineering, out of this slide because I don't know, frankly, if he uh, has, has an entrepreneurial uh, a gene in him or not. I don't, I don't think so. But the point is this great entrepreneurial enterprise is now being run by corporate people, people who have succeeded in big corporations. That may be exactly what Apple needs right now, but it marks a departure. So I know we have plenty of time for questions. I will say thank you and remind you where you can, where you can communicate with me. And uh, I'm, I'm ready to go when you are. Thank you, Adam. And by the way, we are going to get Tim Cook at our global conference someday. That is not an endorsement to sell your stock when that happens, just so you know. I wish you good luck with that. <laughs> Later, I'll tell you a trick about how wonderful, I did that. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> All right, so we're going to ha open up questions to the audience. Uh, we have two microphones. If you have a mic, you can ask the question. One question, please. No long statements. We can get as many people as we can. Uh, also, if you could put the Twitter hashtag back up there, please. So we're still doing Twitter questions throughout. If you want to Twitter your question, 
we'll do a couple of those while we're here. There's the, the hashtag. So who, uh, who wants to have the first question right here? It ain't really a question. I just want to say I just enjoyed the heck out of your talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. <laughs> The next one's going to have to be tougher, though. Who else? <laughs> we have one kind of in the middle there. Hang on. What do you see as the biggest challenge that Apple has going forward? Well, identify one of them uh, in terms of leadership. How do you, how do you replace a legend? And uh, this is a very controversial topic within Apple, by the way, because on the one and you you talk to senior Apple people and they'll tell you on the one hand, yes, Steve was all the things that everybody says he was. And then they'll say, then they'll complain and say, but he didn't do everything. I mean, we're really good and we did all these things. And I think both of those things are true. I genuinely believe that. But there's no denying that they, they lost a unique, a key, you know, the ultimate key man, if, if you will, to use an insurance term. But that's not their only challenge. I think, um, to sort of summarize it, they are now so big and so complex and under so much scrutiny that it's going to be very difficult for them to pull off these magic acts in the same way. So, you know, the days are gone where they're going to just, where we're going to sit down and, oh, there's an iPhone. You know, now there's all of this, there's, there's people crawling around their factories in China and talking to anyone everyone that anyone can think of to try to learn their secrets including the kind of work that I'm that I'm trying to do and so I think that scrutiny is going to change the nature of of what Apple of what Apple is and um, you know 12 to 15 years ago there was this loyal base of what we now call fanboys and fangirls who hung on Apple's every word today to some extent, we're all Apple fanboys and fangirls, and so there's, there's, there are that many more of us watching them. And then there are all the normal concerns. They have, the competition can see them coming better than they could before. Um, and in the technology business, as Apple has proved, uh, you, know, you're, you have no barrier to entry. There's someone who comes up with a the, with the better idea can knock you off your perch, as they've now done to countless companies, Sony, Microsoft, um, the, 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 the Dell, the list goes on and on. Now, Adam, we're going to go to our first Twitter question. Okay. Does Apple secure all intercompany email and phone text data? How do they prevent <sighs> surveillance? You know, I don't know that, technically, I don't know the answer to that. I don't have any reason to believe that they use any different technical uh, tactics than any other company would use to monitor employee emails, for example. What they have is this. Uh, this this uh, this moral force or th this uh, emotional coercion. I mean, it's not even about emails. I, I, in my book, I write about uh, someone I know who attends a poker game with a bunch of Apple people, and this is someone who is an engineer in the Valley. Valley engineers love to talk to each other about what they're working on. This person told me that when the subject of Apple comes up at the poker table, the subject is changed. They don't talk about work with anybody. I talked to someone recently who's son-in-law works at, at Apple and uh, sh she told me that her, her, um, her daughter said, yeah, my husband is off on a business trip, I think to Hong Kong, but I have no idea why. Um, they, I don't think they need sophisticated technology to, to make sure that their employees uh, keep their mouths shut. Thank you. Um, regarding secrecy, what kind of issues uh, or what kind of discussions within Apple occurred uh, regarding these concerns as production increasingly kept going overseas and what were some of the uh, uh, the techniques they used to to allay those fears well you mean to allay the fears that uh, that their partners abroad would disclose would divulge their secrets yeah yeah well I don't know is the short answer. What I do know is that they're, they're very upfront with everybody they deal with about their insistence that you know, non-disclosure agreements be, be honored. So it's not just their factories in China. It would be somebody that they bring in to do some marketing collateral assistance uh, on campus. Um, 
you know, they, they, ask pe they ask people who are coming to visit, like for a friendly lunch, not to tweet about their visit to the Apple campus or to check in on Foursquare, for example, because people might draw conclusions about why you're visiting. So I don't have a good answer. I don't think that, you know, I don't think Foxconn, for example, divulging uh, product secrets has been a giant concern, you know, because they have a strong relationship with people like that. Uh, yeah, I think they're more concerned at the margin than they are at the core. But I'm, I'm truly ad-libbing that answer because I don't know. No yeah. <laughs> at the core, yeah, right. Thank you. You know, I have yes. Apple being one of the world's most admired companies, of, I guess, in the United States, it's, uh, we have a vested interest in its success. Yep. Has the government, whether it be on the federal or state level, been a hindrance or an aid in the development and the uh, making Apple what it is today as one of the world's most admired companies? Has the government been a hindrance? Well, um, so, you know, Apple, the, the New York Times did a lengthy story, uh, ex uh, you know, ex exploring whether or not Apple's to be blamed for the fact that it employs so many, so fewer people than, say, General Motors did in the 50s when it was the dominant company. Apple has, Apple is almost the prototypical American wealth creator in that it does employ tens of thousands of people in, in the United States, mostly in California, who are, in intele who are essentially in intellectual property creation jobs. And then it, it indirectly employs hundreds of thousands more outside the United States. Um, you know, I don't have an opinion on, on whether or not, uh, to what extent that's a result of, of government policy. My hunch would be that that's not something that Apple spends a lot of time thinking about. They have, they, they, do, go, they do lobbying the same way every big company does lobbying, but they're not a particularly, I mentioned they're not, they don't have a political culture. They're also not particularly political in the, uh, in, in the federal or, or, or state sense of political. I don't think they think that they've been hindered or helped by the U.S. government, which I think was your question, one way or the other. Again, not my strong area of expertise, though. I'm, I'm just following instructions here. Hi. I'm here. Yes. Yes. Back here. Hi. Hi. I really enjoy your talk. Thank you. And uh, my question is, now they don't have Steve Jobs. So who's going to, going to be the visionary to tell consumer what they want? And who's going to come up with the iPad, iPhone, iPod, all those products we didn't know that we cannot live without? That is the question. And if you can find it out, you know, I would like you to tell me. Uh, you know, there's both a, there's both a specific question here. Who? Who is it? <laughs> I don't know who it is. And, uh, and I think one of the answers to the question might be that there isn't a person. And then you have to ask the question, will that work? can that work? We know that's not how they did it for the last 15 years. What we do know is that, and this is what I was getting at earlier, they've developed a process. They have a deep bench of excellent people. The senior people have all, all but one, worked with Steve Jobs for more than 12 years. It's a very durable, uh, long-serving executive management team. So they know his style. They have their own opinions about how he would approach certain things. They have a product pipeline that he would have been at least knowledgeable about that will last anywhere from 18 months to five years, depending on whose opinion you seek uh, inside the Apple world. And so these are some of my observations, and I can't tell you better than anybody else can if that process will succeed in creating magic again. Common sense would suggest that the answer is no. Um, but I don't know if common sense will apply. I just don't know. That's the story I'm going to be looking at. Can I answer that question? Sir, we'll get to the microphone to you in a minute. We've we got he a couple people ahead of us. He did his chance at a question. But. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, actually, it's a good segue. Adam, way, I'm way over here to the next Twitter question. It says, do people in meetings at Apple now openly ask, what would jobs do? If not, why not? G great question. So um, <clears throat> here's what we know about that question. Uh, Tim Cook has said publicly that toward the end of Steve Jobs' life, Jobs said to him, uh, you know, one of Disney's problems in the late 1960s was that executives went around saying, what would Walt do? And uh, Walt Disney Company went into a, a bad period after Walt Disney's death because man be one of the reasons, perhaps, was because management was um, too afraid to do things differently from what they perceived Walt would have wanted them to have done. And Jobs said to Cook, 
don't ask what I would do, do what you think is right for Apple. That's what we know from, from their public statements. Um, human nature suggests to me that they're absolutely asking themselves what would, what, what would Steve do, but this is what they've said, and I think what they've said is, is not irrelevant to use the double negative because at least they're, they're thinking about the fact that they, that they need to have a bias for doing what they think is right, and at least they have a frame of, uh, a frame of reference or a way to have the argument. Yeah, I know this is what Steve would do, but here's why I think this is the right way. Yes. Hi. Um, what would you say is the company morale outside the top 100 employees? So um, I think what you're asking, another way of what you're asking me is, do people enjoy working at Apple, and is it, is it fun to work there? And I'll, I'll recount my own reporting on the subject. When I was first working on this for Fortune, I was very interested in this topic. And I would ask people, is it, is it a fun place to work? And, and I want to remind you or tell you that you know, typical corporate reporting is to go in and talk to the CEO and a bunch of really top executives and then write the story. But for this, I focused on ex-Apple employees primarily because I didn't want to get Apple people fired by even trying. I didn't want to trick them into talking to me and then having them lose their jobs. But I talked to people who worked at all levels of the organization. I mean all levels. Because from my perspective, you know, a junior person's experiences were relevant to this question among others. And so the response would be something like, um, Apple people understand and buy into the mission of the company very well. And I say, yeah, but I asked you, is it fun? And they said, you know, Apple people take great pride in looking around the room and seeing the products that they contributed to. And I said, okay, I'm slow, but not stupid. I get it. Um, you know, engineers will tell you it's very fun because they're, they're in a playground that is like exactly what they dreamed about doing almost since they, you know, got out of diapers was to, uh, was to work on Macintosh computers or, or to work, and now to work on Apple products. Um, but other people in the organization describe it as a stressful, um, you know, long hours uh, place where it's a work environment, not a play environment. They don't seek to entertain their employees the way so many other companies do. They demand that their employees work hard because they've got a lot of hard work to do. That's the, cult, the, cult, the corporate mindset. You hear about people being upset, uh, being unhappy, and then you say, well, why do they stay for so long? Well, they've made a lot of money. That wasn't the original intent because they, 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 they didn't know they were going to make a lot of money if they joined 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, they're also playing for a winning team. They play for a team that wins the World Series year after year after year, and there's a lot of truly uh, pride and accomplishment in that. Adam, over here. Sorry. Just speak, and I'll find yeah. you. There you go. Yep. Adam, Stephen Mead again. Good to see you. Um, Hi. If you were to strip away the name Apple, and you were to write about a company that was one of the most valuable companies in the world, sitting on $48 billion cash, built on a closed platform that forced you to use their equipment. Did you say 48? 110. Go ahead. 110. Yeah. And outsource a large percentage of their workforce overseas, that company would be vilified. What has Apple done, in your opinion, to, to maintain its image as something as a great thought leader, even though there's all these things that could be stacked against them? Well, um, I mean, simply put, they're, the way they've marketed their product and themselves is the answer to the question. So, uh, you know, I, I believe that consumers practice cognitive dissonance in all sorts of ways. So we, we love to complain about things. It's, it's almost an American birthright to complain. And so we'll complain about, some people will complain about the, the labor conditions in China or Apple's uh, lack of con perceived lack of concern for the environment. You raised some of the other areas that people, you know, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't pay their taxes or they do whatever they can. I should say, to not pay their taxes, another, a subject of another fine New York Times article, and yet people love their products. I don't think that's terribly inconsistent. People love Apple because they love their products, and they love them in a, because they're different, and in many cases, and for many people, because they're better. And so people love the company that makes them. And, and you, know, you can point to other products, to other companies that, that people love, because they love their products. And, you know, I'm, I haven't given this any direct thought, but, you know, people love IKEA, for example, because they like the products and the shopping experience. People love Apple because they love the products and the shopping experience. Right here? Yes. 
<coughs> Hi there. Hi. Um, how do you see the relationship with Samsung playing out over the next few years between Apple and Samsung? I, you know, I don't have any great insight other than that um, people who understand uh, patent litigation have explained to me that these, these episodes follow a predictable path and uh, they're, they're, they've happened before and they'll happen again and they always have a finite end period where they, um, they play out to the extent that people uh, or companies that haven't, that haven't cross-licensed the technology that they needed to cross-license either win and don't have to cross-license or they lose and they have to cross-license and then the battles end and people go on their, their, their merry way and I think so it's, it's, it's unusual to people outside the tech industry that Apple has this uh, love-hate relationship with Samsung where Samsung is an, um, is an important supplier to Apple and there doesn't seem to be anything changing that or stopping that. Apple doesn't seem to be trying to freeze Samsung out that I know of from being a supplier and then at the same time they're, they're competing bitterly on these products. By the way, I, you know, at, to, to generalize, the, uh, their, their dispute is not, the dispute is not between Samsung and Apple. The dispute is between Apple and Google, and uh, the patent law requires that Apple be in litigation with Samsung because they're the ones selling the product. But this is about Android software and, and Apple's uh, hurt feelings over, over what Android telephones do, and Samsung's a big seller of Android smartphones. But so I, other than the fact that I think it will end and they'll go back to being run-of-the-mill uh, frenemies. Uh, I, I don't have any great insight into how that will play out. Hi. Adam? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. Doing your interviews with these ex-Apple employees, what was their one complaint or issue with Apple and why they left? You know, um, not to be trite, but they typically didn't have a complaint or an issue. They were, by and large, to generalize, they were exhausted. And they also suffered often from an extreme case of wealth. Um, but some would say that, and now I'll be a little more serious, because there, there, there was also an undercurrent of uh, I knew that it was always going to be about Apple. And uh, I'm ready for whatever reason to do something that's going to be about me. The, the thing that I create. This is the entrepreneurial spirit, after all, to create something that I can take ownership of. And so people will say that. Not many have done it yet. Um, I think for a long time people were, at the senior level, were afraid to leave because they didn't want to compete against Steve Jobs and they didn't want him bad-mouthing them in the, in, in the workplace. And they were very, and flipping that around, they were very loyal to him as well. He was, for all of his you know, negative traits, he was charismatic and charming and convincing, especially to the talent that he wanted to retain. Yes. Uh, Adam, uh, it seems to me that in addition to products, what Apple did was revolutionize industries. Um, I is, there, is there one on the horizon? Is it television? Um, are they, is there another industry they will revolutionize? So I, um, I, I openly advertise that I'm not a product expert. I read the same product gossip blogs that everybody else reads and I've been able to carve out a niche of explaining their approach to business which I where I feel I can add some value and where I can't necessarily add value on products um, I believe that that they will do something that is video consumption oriented you know what they've you know, I'm not trying to choose my words carefully to be you know diplomatic but because I don't know and because I'll point out that we never knew exactly like about the other things. We knew they were thinking about a phone, but we couldn't have predicted what the iPhone would look like. Importantly, they didn't predict an important part about what the iPhone would look like. So, and what I mean by that is, it's a fact that when the iPhone was released in 2007, there was no app store. And because they missed the boat, they didn't know that, they didn't know that these third-party apps were gonna be a big deal, to their credit. They paid attention to what was going on, which was that uh, hackers were hacking into the iPhone to put software applications on the iPhone. And rather than, in this instance, they've been plenty stubborn about other things, but rather than be stubborn about it and sue these people, they said they had the presence of mind to say, uh, oh, we get it. We need to enable that behavior because that's going to be really good for us. And in eight months, they introduced the App Store. They're they, they able to turn the aircraft carrier. So. 
but, but we didn't know what the iPad market was going to look like before they came out with it. We didn't know we needed an iPad, did we? Um, and, and so on. So I, I'm not presumptuous enough to think that I know what their, you know, their TV product will look like, other than that it's not the Apple TV that, that we see today. I think that's a... Um, I think that's a, a, a state, uh, what's the expression? You know, this, this gives them stakes to sit at the poker table. They're in the, they're in the video business with the Apple TV and with selling movies on, on iTunes. So they, they're in the conversation with some of your neighbors and maybe some people in the room. But, um, yeah, and, so, and, what we, you know, and then everyone's just hanging on this one line in Walter Isaacson's book where he said to, where Steve Jobs said to him, I think we've really cracked this TV thing. But we don't, I don't know if Walter knows and if, if we know what he meant by that. <laughs> yes, sir. Adam, I'm curious if you could compare um, and contrast uh, in terms of uh, customer focus and... Uh, this is a reminder to buy books at the, at the conclusion, uh, at the conclusion and the, of this. And an effective one. Yeah. Um, to compare uh, Facebook and Apple in terms of their focus on the customer, their ecosystem, and... Um, how the cultures of the companies uh, stack up, in your opinion? Well, they're very different companies, obviously, in, in that uh, Facebook is in this social media field that didn't exist 10 years ago, and, uh, and Apple is, a, is effectively a hardware company that does very good software. But they have some cultural characteristics, from what I understand, that are very similar, obviously founded by brash, young college dropouts, uh, who are, uh, you know, Jobs was technically competent, but not technically credentialed. Uh, Zuckerberg is probably more technical. He's not credentialed either because he didn't graduate, but he's actually a coder. And Steve Jobs never was a real engineer. Um, it's an engineering culture, by the way. Engineers rule the roost at Facebook. They rule the roost at, at Apple as well, if you include designers in that. But it's not a, you know, they don't think business first. They think business second. Um, so those are some of the, some of the similar characteristics. The, Facebook spent a great deal of time not focused on, on revenue. Uh, you know, we'll find out if that was to their detriment or not. I, I don't fault them for it, but um, anyway, very different companies. By the way, uh, Apple, people in the Valley will tell you, uh, is, it doesn't understand social media very well. They're not a good Internet company. This is probably because Steve Jobs didn't understand it. Um, that's a key difference between the two companies. This could be the last question. Sorry, right here, sir. Uh, Adam, great talk. Thanks Thank a lot you. for it. Um, you mentioned briefly Apple's near-death experience in the late 90s. Yeah. And I think that's sort of an interesting you know, matter of history to, to look at a little more. Uh, a lot of people would say that a big part of the reason that happened, and as you mentioned, they only had single mid-single digits for their hardware at the time. Um, they, their model was high priced, uh, low volume, they hoped for high margins, whereas in the Windows world, the model was high volume, yeah. low price, uh, low margins perhaps, although it turned out to be high margins. Anyway, so they basically almost destroyed Apple uh, in its first lifespan, I guess you'd say. Right. And so what I'm wondering about sort of related to the fact that they were reborn, they had a tremendous turnaround and great success now, what were the lessons that Apple learned from its near-death experience and did it have anything to do with what it charged for its products? Well, it's an interesting question. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because now Apple has, has several business models. So to this day, the Macintosh is not a high, high market share product, although its market share is growing faster than the competition's, still a low market share high margin, um, high growth, and highly profitable product. It's, it, 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 it's, uh, it's become Apple's annuity stream. It's one of the reasons why Apple can take great risks, because the Macintosh throws off so much cash for, for the company. But um, by and large, it's still a high price point company. And so I don't think they took the lesson away from the Macintosh that they needed to uh, lower prices although we don't have enough time to discuss it, obviously. They are flirting with low prices for the first time ever. Uh, they did with iTunes. That was different. But now they are with free iPhones, uh, which is not free. Uh, they, they get revenue from those free iPhones, but still it's a low price point. Uh, but they stayed a high price point company all throughout that time. But what absolutely changed is that they went after high, high volume. 
And so the iPod was always a high volume, high margin, uh, high price point product. And clearly going for big volume has become part of the playbook. And that's part of the secret sauce. They spend all this money on machining and manufacturing the iPhone and the iPad on the assumption that they will sell a lot of them, not a little, not a few. Um, so it's evolving, but uh, they, they haven't exactly become the Chevrolet of the computer industry, not yet. Adam, thank you so much. Let thank you, everybody. Please thank, thank Adam Lefinsky. Thank you. This book is for sale, reminder, and he will sign copies of your book right over here. Thank you for coming.